order, which I just did, and will be available for on-demand viewing on YouTube as a conference registrant. You will automatically receive access to the recording after the session is completed. Um, we've set aside time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. And if you'd like to ask a question, if you think of one while Heidi is presenting, um, feel free to enter it in the Q&A. Um, we, again, we have a chat feature and a Q&A. The Q&A is where we want questions um, for the presenter. So feel free to enter that in. I'll kind of keep an eye on those. Uh, Heidi asked me that if, since we have a smaller group, um, we can certainly interrupt her uh, if there's a question pertinent, pertinent to what she's talking about at the time, and I'll keep an eye on those questions. And I think, Heidi, you can also see the Q&A as well. Thank you. But I'll, I'll, you can I'll let you do that. <laughs> okay. So before we begin, um, we want to recognize that the Minnesota history spans at least 13,000 years. The vast majority of that time is represented by American Indian history alone. And from that perspective, our urban and rural built environments are very recent. The state of Minnesota, as it's been known since 1858, is within the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. The 11 tribal nations in Minnesota are our partners in advocating for recognition and protection of the state's cultural resources, along with other Native nations with historical connections here. The State Historic Preservation Office is currently in the final stages of updating our statewide historic preservation plan for the next 10 years. Among other goals, we seek to broaden the scope of equity of historic preservation through identification and designation of more historic properties important to tribes and underrepresented communities, including traditional cultural properties, cultural landscapes, archaeological sites, buildings, and structures. We encourage you to be a part of this effort to work with us and others to build partnerships and advance these historic preservation efforts across the state. And now I will turn it over to Heidi, who will present. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that intro. So thank you for all of you who have joined on this uh, third day of the conference in the afternoon. <laughs> um, appreciate you hanging in there with us and joining us. Um, so as I mentioned, it looks like there's a small group. So please um, put your questions in and if there's any questions as we go along. Uh, after I, you know, had submitted all this and it was accepted, uh, and I was starting to put the presentation together, I realized, wow, I picked a really broad topic, <laughs> and there's a lot of information to cover. So I, I'm just trying to cover kind of some of the main points and main issues related to restoring to historic interiors. Obviously, there's a lot more information that could be covered on this. So um, if you do have any questions as we're going through, of course, um, you know, join this. So first off, we're going to talk about like kind of why why do I want to talk about historic interiors anyway? Um, right after I got licensed as an architect uh, there in Minnesota, I almost immediately got my certification as an interior designer as well because I was doing work, uh, mostly new construction at the time, but um, some remodeling work. But I was doing interiors work, so I always kind of throughout my career have been doing both architecture and interiors, both um, and see the value of working on a building as a complete whole instead of two separate pieces. Uh, when I left Minnesota, I went to get a master's in historic preservation, and I did my master's on an internship at Yosemite National Park, where the historical architect there pushed really hard for me to pick a topic in Yosemite to write a report about <laughs> as my thesis so that they could get basically a free report by a college student, which at that point, I probably said I was already licensed, so they were getting an advanced report. Um, so I picked the interior of the Wani's Hotel as my, my thesis topic, um, partly because of my interest in interiors. And I re realized that this is one area of preservation that doesn't get a lot of attention. And I thought something that we should, should talk about a lot more. So throughout this presentation, there'll be lots of information specific to the Iwani Hotel. Um, because that is the building I have studied the interiors of in minute detail, um, down to every piece of furniture in this building. <laughs> so, uh, and every light fixture and just every, every little detail. So, um, and then I'm going to bring in a bunch of other types of interiors as well. So we'll, we'll go through all of that. So, I mean, the other thing to talk about, you know, like, 
yeah, this this is in Chicago here. This this building is particularly sad because it's an empty storefront <laughs> as well these days. But um, this whole facadectomy thing, where we only have a facade that we keep and we don't keep the inside of the building, is just really not a very good approach. We all, you know, I think most preservationists will look at this and go, "Ick," you know, why? Why? Um, so that that's this is just what we don't want to do. So so why the interior? I think. For me, there's lots of reasons, but the biggest thing is that the really the stories uh, of the people that were in these spaces, the design these spaces, um, those intimate stories are what are in the interior spaces. It's you know that whole you know if the walls could talk, right? Um, so it it's really a key point of documenting history is to document these historic spaces inside of buildings where where important things happened. So. Uh, and then there's just there's a lot of craftsmanship that's represented inside of a building um, that you can't find in the exterior. Um, so the, there's some unique materials and, and things that we need to uh, maintain. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, most of us spend our time indoors, especially during this pandemic. Uh, and so here's an example of actually a building where the historic interiors is way more important than the exterior. So this is this is a building that I did some documentation on uh, when I was working in San Francisco, and from the street, this is this is the pretty side of the street of this. Uh, and it being in San Francisco, to the left of this building, that this retaining wall takes a uh, a steep dive down the the steep street and becomes two stories high at the corner. Uh, so this little entrance is actually the most beautiful part of the exterior facade of this building. Uh, but you, other than these nice plaques on the outside of it, you wouldn't necessarily distinguish this as a historic building. Um, it, you can see a little bit of kind of some Bay Area arts and crafts detailing, but not a whole lot, right? It's not not really going to draw you in all that well. However, you go into the courtyard, and there's this beautiful, luscious courtyard that's elevated above the street level. And then you go into one of, I think, one of the most unique and interesting arts and crafts um, spaces that I've ever seen. Um, this picture doesn't even begin to do justice to the space. It is a very fine and unique space. Uh, there's other auxiliary spaces um, to this building as well that have some really fine craftsmanship uh, and your typical Bay Area arts and crafts detailing. So, just just an example of where this this is really listed because of its interior detailing um, and in some of the courtyard detailing, but certainly not for its public facade. So when we're do, working on interiors, um, I, I go back to one of the things that my high school calculus teacher used to say all the time. She said the rules of a game are the same. She actually had this and a little plaque up in front of the, the classroom over the the marker board and would point at it every time uh, we were struggling with some calculus things just like you know one plus one equals two and one dingbat plus another dingbat equals two dingbats and it's just a way to emphasize that the things are still within the same process and that's really true when we're talking about historic interiors all of the same guidelines that we would use uh, for the exterior of a historic building apply to the interior equally and in the same basic way there's some unique things that will and deep challenges that we have to deal with on interiors, but the secretary standards still apply. We still have to do the same type of research and design process. Um, I don't know if you guys got to uh, participate in the program I did last yesterday uh, with Chris Hartnett. Uh, we, we talked about the importance of doing all the historical research and condition assessment and investigation of buildings before you start a, a design project. Uh, that all applies, whether it's the exterior of the building or the interior. Uh, most of the time, all of your historic furnishings or, or restoring your historic furnishings, those are qualified expenses for your tax credits. So um, it's it's part of that whole process. Uh, and we, we kind of approach it the same way. So the hierarchy of spaces is really similar to the way we would define, like, you know, a primary facade versus a secondary facade. And we're going to go through and we're going to do character defining features and, and integrity evaluations, um, just like we would on it. So, this is uh, the 
the plan of the Iwani Hotel. I should note that I, I did my master's thesis on this, and then a few years after I did my master's thesis on this, uh, the firm I was working for at the time in San Francisco was hired to do a full historic structures report update, a full historic furnishings report, and a full cultural landscape report for this building. So um, I got to expand on my initial work. Uh, so this, this is actually a page out of the historic structures report that was updated while I was working at ARG. And it's just evaluating like the most important buildings, uh, spaces, on down through that. And for a complicated building, we would usually do something like this. For a more simple building, we don't need to do that. So there's some, uh, like at a church, you know, or a synagogue or a temple or any other type of worship uh, space, there's some obvious um, hierarchy that just comes by function, right? So usually the sanctuary or the worship space is always going to be the most important, you know, the foyer or the the, the space that leads into that, uh, if there's a secondary chapel or fellowship hall. And so, so just kind of working your way down with the mechanical rooms and the storage rooms being the least significant. Uh, this church I'll talk about more later when we get back to this. Um, similarly, like if we're looking at a post office, I mean, this happens to be a really giant post office, the Chicago main post office. Uh, but these principles actually would apply to any size of a post office from your local neighborhood or small town post office uh, all the way up to one of the probably the largest post office in the U.S., right? Uh, so the main lobby is always going to be the most important spot. It's going to have the highest finishes. Um, if you happen to have a post office that was built uh, during the New Deal, it's going to have some New Deal murals in it. It's, you know, there's going to be a lot of decorative stuff in that lobby. And the post uh, master's office is also gonna have some higher finishes and it's gonna be important too. And then you got a kind of a big jump down in. So you might have some vaults in, in this large uh, post office. We have vaults, we don't always have those in the smaller post offices. And then you get to the sorting areas and the loading docks, like what you see in this photo below to the left, uh, where it's really just raw space. And I don't know if you've been following this, but you know, there's a million square feet of this raw space and the old Chicago post office and huge major corporations are now moving into the space to repurpose it. Um, but this is one of those things where this is just really raw space, uh, but they were able to restore the important spaces and then just repurpose the other spaces. So on a much smaller scale, this is a little, uh, playground building that I worked on in San Francisco. Uh, I was the advising architect. The city of San Francisco have their own architecture staff, their own Bureau of Architecture. So I was advising them on this. So one of the things on this building, um, they initially were going to tear it down and build another building, the almost exact same size, almost the exact same footprint in the same place. And um, they were convinced to not do that. Um, so um, they ended up moving this building off of its site, putting new foundations under it and putting it back together or putting it back in the same spot. And we ended up identified two spaces in particular that were historically significant. And then the rest of it, we needed to upgrade it so that it met ADA. So all of the toilet rooms and the kitchen all got upgraded um, to meet ADA. And we'll, again, we'll get back to this one later in the presentation. Similarly, this is a current project that I'm working on with the Canton Historical Society. It's a small local, small town train depot. There were actually several of these that were created from the same plan. And the waiting rooms are the highest priority. The ticket office is kind of the second priority. And then the freight room is the third priority. And we'll get back to this one again too. Um, while I'm here, let me just point out one, one quick thing. So here in this corner of here is where we're going to actually be recreating the ticket counter. And I'll talk about that more later uh, as we get to that. So as I mentioned, we're, we're going to define the character defining features of each room. Um, and there's two basic guidelines the, that we're going to use for that, the preservation brief 17 and 18. Uh, in this example, this is a historic house in Polo, Illinois. And when I, I first walked through the house with the homeowner, 
she immediately, you know, she was, this was the, the one piece in the house that she wanted to show me the most this to her and, and arguably to a lot of people, this, this was like the most interesting detail of the house. Now it, this house had a lot of really cool detailing. So, um, this wasn't necessarily a thing I thought was the most interesting, but, um, she immediately identified this as a Tiffany glass surround. It, it is a glass mosaic. Um, based on the design of it, I wouldn't necessarily automatically attribute this to Tiffany, um, but uh, one of those things that would have had to have obviously been researched a lot more, but very nicely done. The detailing corresponds really well to the cast iron insert, and it is a very exquisite detail in this home. So going back to the Iwani again, this is the dining room the Iwani, which is one of the highest significant spaces in this highly significant building. So this is right out of the historic structures report, the character defining features of the space itself. So um, this is all of the things that are attached to the building and are part of the building itself. So everything from the floors, the walls, the columns, the beams, the trusses, the lights, um, the windows, the doors, all that is part of the built uh, and, and connected to the building part of it. Um, so then when we're looking at the historic interiors, we have to go one step further um, and define the movable pieces within that space that also contribute to the historic significance and the experience in that space. Um, so the draperies and the drapery rods, this is going to be true of almost all um, historic projects. Window coverings are an important part of how you perceive a space, how light is let into a space, how views are, are uh, viewed from the space and are going to be key to defining that historic space. Um, in here, we have just tables and chairs because there's a dining room, but any, any furniture, of course, is, is part of the, the character of the space. The arrangement of that furniture in this particular space, this center aisle that's always been kept clear in the middle of this room is really significant because it leads to a picture window at the end of the dining hall that has a pictured view of Yosemite Falls. So you can't get much more dramatic than that. Um, but the, the number of tables, the sizes of the tables has changed frequently and then gets moved around frequently, but this leaving this one space open in the middle of the room actually um, is really significant to the way you experience the room. Um, there's also a freestanding screen, uh, which of course is kind of grayed out here on the edge of the screen, uh, which actually blocks the view for when waiters and waitresses are coming in and out of the kitchen. Um, there's some historic rugs that are hung up here. You can barely see them at the back of the room. And then this room is unique in that um, from the day it was opened, this dining room has had custom china that has been maintained throughout. I mean, they replaced the china over the years, but the custom pattern of it has been maintained. So that's really part of the, the character and experience of this room. It's always been a fine dining thing. So we've always had, you know, the white tablecloths and the kind of formal setting and all uh, place settings and all that. And then the views and the vistas are, are really an important part of this room and in most rooms, um, just like you have a picture hanging on a wall, the picture window is really important. And we can't forget about that, that connection to the exterior is part of the experience of the interior. So let's talk a little bit about historic furnishings report. So just a little background on historic furnishings report in, in general. Uh, they were really kind of brought about as a response to uh, working with historic house museums. Um, and they were intended to just be a way to bring together all of the information on a historic house museum and the, the furniture layout and all that stuff. So when I was working on my master's thesis, um, it was a kind of a unique situation where I was applying standards that are typically used for a house museum where furniture is kind of arranged and, and left that way in a stagnant layout um, to working in a hotel that is still actively used as a hotel, but still has a significant number of pieces that are original to the place and then has a bunch of things that aren't 
original to the place, which may or may not be complementary to the original uh, design. And then um, just, you know, figuring out what was what it was, a was a huge part of kind of what we were going through it, we didn't have a good uh, listing of what was historic. I found a lot of historic furniture that wasn't on the reserve property list and that wasn't uh, identified as historic that, that we were able to um, identify. So uh, usually the historic uh, furnishings report is either completed after or simultaneous with the historic structures report. Um, and this is because a lot of the research is going to be the same. Um, and typically, the stuff that's included in the historic structures report is again all the stuff that's really attached to the building. Uh, the stuff that's not attached is the stuff that's in the furnishings report. But this is a gray area. So sometimes a uh, historic furnishings report will also talk about like wallpapers or other types of finishes that are applied. Um, and sometimes that'll be in a historic structures report. If you have a small, simple structure with not too sophisticated or, or elaborate of furnishings, you might include all of that in your historic structures report and not actually provide a separate report. So um, there, there is a little bit of a gray area between, <laughs> between these two reports. The, the key is that you just want to make sure that you have everything covered and that, that everything is included. So, so in this, this photo here, this, this sofa that's in the middle here, this, um, it is actually one of the original pieces. It actually still has the uh, horse hair stuffing in the in the uh, seats still, and uh, was one of those pieces that was not on the list that should have been on the list. These lamps next to them are not original and are actually not appropriate for this room. They they might be okay overall as appropriate for the hotel, but there was a specific design. Uh, intent in this room that these don't really respond to so so this is just uh, kind of one of the key things there's two pieces that really uh you want to see in a historic uh, furnishings report one is a, a combination of all the descriptions of the design of that room so this could be personal letters that describe the room it could be and like in this case we actually had uh, the original designer's description of the design for these rooms, which is unusual. We don't usually get that kind of information. Um, we also had an inventory from 1943. Um, the hotel was actually taken over by the Navy for a couple of years during the war. So prior to the Navy taking over the space, they went through and they inventoried room by room what was in each room they put metal tags on all of the furniture to catalog all of it because most of it was moved off site. Um, and they took historic photographs of it. So actually Ansel Adams took some color photographs of the hotel uh, before they moved in. So we had this wonderful resource of information um, more than you might find uh, in if you're researching like a house museum or something like that. So we were really kind of fortunate in the wealth of information that we had. Um, so this is a summary of kind of the original descriptions, uh, the original tag numbers. These numbers were actually look at, uh, put onto little brass plates that were put under the furniture. So it was, it was key for us in, in helping us identify uh, what was original and what wasn't. If it had a little brass tag on it, it was original and it had a number and we had an inventory. We knew what it was and where it had originally been. Um, now, some of the furniture was really heavy and it wasn't easy to find these tags. So some of them we didn't get to, but, um, and then we had a, a wealth of historic photographs. So all of the, which are catalog numbered uh, from the archives there at Yosemite. So we were able to uh, reference uh, each of these to the historic photographs to the the current tags that were put on to some of these and then also to the reserve property. So let me back up a second and just talk about reserve property. Uh, this is something that's unique to properties that are owned by the National Park Service and are run by a concessionaire. 
So the building itself at the Iwani is owned by the National Park Service. It is leased to the concessionaire who runs the hotel. Um, so everything that's attached to the building is owned by the Park Service. Everything that is not attached to the building, all the furniture is owned by the concessionaire, but is quote reserved and must be passed down from one concessionaire to the next when the concessionaire contract runs out. So it is tied to the hotel, but it's actually the property of the concessionaire. Um, so this makes it a little bit more challenging to manage this. Uh, in theory, everything that is done to any of this historic furniture is supposed to be reviewed with the National Park Service for them to approve what's happening with that. Uh, while I was working on the hotel, uh, I was sitting in the Great Lounge one day and I saw people just taking furniture out to be reupholstered. And I called up the folks at the Park Service like, did you know about this? Like, no, we didn't know about it. So uh, that whole process of how historic furniture is managed and overseen uh, is, is a challenge. It's a little bit different, obviously, than dealing with the building itself. So this is another project that I worked on. This is a Mies van der Rohe house that was built in Elmhurst, Illinois as a prototype for what was going to be um, what he hoped to be <laughs> some, some mass produced housing. And it, it didn't quite happen. So this was one of only two houses that were built based on his prototype designs. And I, I worked on the historic structures report of this and I worked really closely with the, the director at the time, Jenny Gibbs. And there was a huge desire on the part of the Elmhurst Art Museum who, who owns this building to, to try to do some restoration of the interiors as well and do more interpretative taping of this house like you would a typical house museum. However, we didn't have a lot of documentation on any of the furnishings in the house. This is one of the early photographs of the house, but this was a photo taken by Hedrick Blessing um, that Mies and McCormick and Greenwald, uh, who were the, the development team for these houses, um, they took these photos for marketing purposes. Um, in one of the other photographs, there's actually uh, some of the Barcelona chairs in the living room. I found correspondence from McCormick saying that they were not going to buy Barcelona chairs for the house. <laughs> so uh, we know that these were staged. Uh, so we don't really have any good photographs of what the original furniture actually was in the space, what the McCormick family actually had in there. Um, for example, in this picture, we have a table with two chairs kind of jammed up against a wall. Well, we know there was a family of four plus a live-in maid that lived here. Uh, and this just seems a little uh, odd that we would have such a small table for five people. So this is, you know, part of the, the problem. The other thing is that, you know, we only have a glimpse of one desk in one of the bedrooms on the left hand side of this photo. We don't have any information on what the beds look like or what, um, you know, the linens looked like or any of that kind of stuff. So there just wasn't enough information. And this was a really tough decision as I was working through this with, with the management of the museum. It's like they really wanted to do something, but we just didn't have the historical documentation. So ultimately, uh, we decided that we were going to restore the kitchen because we had enough documentation on the kitchen itself. Uh, but we weren't going to try to furnish the rest of the rooms just because we didn't have that historical documentation. So this is, we're going back to this, this Canton Depot that we saw a little bit ago. So this is a much smaller, simpler building, of course, than the Iwani. And it's largely attacked with one key exception on the interior. Uh, this wall that you see is partially taken apart and there's a kind of a gap in it here, uh, is the wall between the ticket office and one of the waiting rooms. And we know that there was a ticket, uh, counter and transaction, uh, window in here somewhere. Uh, we have photographs, uh, 
not, I'm sorry, not photographs. We have drawings of the station that was built in Harmony, which is just down the, the railroad track from, from Canton. And it showed the ticket window, basically where this door is. The door's not, obviously the door's there, so the ticket window wasn't there. So we weren't really sure exactly where that, that ticket booth um, should have been. And we, we had details of how it was built and we had um, an example because the that window is still intact in the Harmony Depot. So we actually have a, a physical example of what that looked like. So when we were doing our inspection, and I wish I had a good photograph of it, but it just didn't photograph because it's under so many layers of paint. We did find a, a shadow of where the bracket that held up this counter was, and it was against the exterior wall here. So that was the clue that gave us the information we needed to be able to recreate that detail. So here is, this is taken from the Harmony Depot drawings. Uh, we were able to just add some additional notes, uh, you know, drawings that were produced for somebody at the turn of the century, you know, maybe the carpenter would automatically know that there should be counterweights on this window and that there'd be pockets for it. But I'm guessing that most of our carpenters these days kind of need a little extra note about that. <laughs> so, um, so that was one of the things that we were, we were able to recreate because we had a, all the historical documentation on it. Um, an interesting note uh, throughout the drawings here, we have these uh, small, you can see the small uh, eight digit, or four digit code, 8064. I actually was able to find that those are a standard millwork profile number. Uh, some of those are still in use today um, and it's easy to relatively find those. So that was a great um, information that we found um, as we were doing research on this building. So let's see how we're doing on time here. Okay, so this is a, a much, much, much simpler. This is at the other spectrum as far as interior <laughs> from the Iwani. This was a historic barn in San Jose, California. Uh, when I was brought in to work on it, the, the barn was in the condition that you see up on the upper left here. It was uh, structurally unsound, uh, to say the least. The termites had had a feast on this building. Uh, all of the interior framing, um, there, I don't think there was a solid piece anywhere in it. So, but the exterior siding on the building actually was relatively good condition. It had been whitewashed originally with a lime wash, uh, and the lime wash actually prevented the termites from eating it, surprisingly. So, uh, so what we ended up doing was we actually pulled all of the boards off of the building, and then we built a whole new structure and put the boards back on it and re-whitewashed it. Uh, but one of the details that we did is, is that there, there's three different functions that were originally in this building. One side of it was for equipment storage. The middle part of the barn was for hay storage. And then the, the barn side that's on the far left on the picture in the lower left was actually where the animals were, were kept. So in that spot, we, we did find some boards that were in sufficient condition that we could actually recreate the little stalls that the uh, animals were in. It's, you know, it's a small detail, but it, it helps to, to narrate the discussion of what went on in this barn. Um, this barn is actually now reused for 4-H kids to uh, take care of goats. So we actually put it back to its original use. So, so I'm gonna take a break. Do we have any questions? <laughs> No, I do not see any questions. In okay. So um, now that I've got a little sip of my tea, I'll take a look. So there's unique challenges to working with interiors. I think it, the biggest one is kind of at the local zoning level, uh, preservation ordinances, which are usually part of the, the zoning ordinance, usually only protect the exterior of a building. Um, so, you know, 
if there's no protection, sometimes people think that means they should just do whatever they want of the interior. Um, the next thing is like a lot of those early register nominations um, just didn't include anything about the interior of a building. Um, those of you who work in preservation, you know, like those those register nominations from the 70s had, you know, sometimes they were only a couple of sentences long and and they just had some general information on the building. They didn't have much description. They didn't kind of define whether the interior was important or not. So um, that's off the challenge um, is to convince owners that, yes, the interior is important uh, as well. Um, so one of the t uh, things too is often we have less historical information on the interior of a building. You know, early photographs really needed daylight, um, so a lot of times, you know, really early photographs of buildings um, only were of the exterior because they couldn't really take uh, interior pictures very easily. Um, a lot of times we have fewer drawings uh, and descriptions of the finishes as well. So. So it is a little bit harder to do the historical research on interior sometimes. Uh, and then there's all those historical elements that aren't attached, right? The furniture, the, the window coverings, all that stuff, uh, because they're not actually attached to the building, all of the usual like incentives and uh, uh, preservation laws don't actually apply to those pieces. So. Uh, we have to approach those in a very different way, uh, and we'll talk more about that uh, later. So there's a lot of things that we're, we're balancing too on interiors, right? Uh, we have current occupant needs, and even when a space remains in the same function, um, the needs for that space sometimes change. Uh, Fashion trends are a real problem <laughs> for interior restoration. Um, buildings that have, like, um, the picture on the left here uh, was the Unity Temple under construction. Uh, my friends at Berglund Construction were the general managers on this, and I, I got a lot of extra um, during the process tours of this this building while it was under construction, and. Um, there was a lot of different color schemes that this space had gone over. Uh, over the years as there was different uh, fashion <laughs> statements for the time. Um, and again, it's another example of time where some space needs have changed as well, um, just as far as uh, sound systems and that kind of thing. Um, and then we can just the portability of furniture and artwork and furnishings. Um, this means that they've walked away from the building, they, literally. Um, when I was working uh, in San Francisco, right when I started working at an architectural resources group, uh, they were just finishing up a project at the um, Alameda Theater in Alameda, California. And there were some original lamp stands that had been in the lobby of that building that somebody had walked off with when the building was shut down as a theater. Now, I don't know, maybe they bought them, maybe they just walked off with them, I'm not judging. Um, but I could tell you, they mysteriously appeared in the alley once the restoration started. And we were actually able to incorporate these freestanding uh, lamps into the, the lobby again. So um, I likewise saw uh, many similar stories when I was talking to the staff at the Iwani. Uh, there were people that knew, well, you know, that piece got thrown in a dumpster and so and so picked it up. And I know whose house it is, but I can't tell you because. I don't want you to go after them. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of kind of detective work that goes into tracking down some of these historic furnishings sometimes, um, which is not a clear path. Um, there's a lot of remodeling that happens um, and, and we'll get to some more. I'll show you some of those examples that um, kind of modern comfort needs. So you know, one of the things that they did here at the Unity Temple, um, they did a geothermal system on this building, so they now have air conditioning and cool, uh, heating instead of just heating in the building. Um, so that's a that's a big comfort issue. Um, and then, of course, we're always dealing with ADA accessibility and life safety codes. Um, so, so I'll give you a couple more examples of this. So this is the Oregon State Hospital um, that I worked on quite a few years ago now. The picture on the left is a kind of a typical. Uh, hallway in one of the wards of the hospital. 
uh, around 1900. The hospital was built in 1883. This was a few years later. This is kind of, you know, what we would expect. The picture on the right is one of the wings that was still being used, and this is what it looks like now. Uh, probably the only kind of character defining feature of this space that you can still identify is basically the width of the corridor. It appears to be about the same. Everything else has changed. The doors have changed. The wall surface has changed. The ceiling surface has changed. The floor surface has changed. Uh, so this is particularly difficult with a hospital setting where they're trying to keep up with the, the latest, you know, requirements for sanitation and all that kind of stuff. Um, ironically, if we go to the next slide, in an unused portion of this building, we have a corridor that looks very much like that one picture from <laughs> the turn of the century. This was in 2007 when we started working on the project. Um, and we have, you know, really a lot of kind of historic integrity as far as finishes and um, but they're in really bad condition. We had, we had some roof leaks that weren't repaired and there was a lot of deterioration. So for those of you who are movie buffs, this hospital uh, might look a little familiar. It is where they filmed One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So <laughs> just a anecdotal thing. So what happened on this project was that uh, essentially they, they tore down a few wings of, of this. Um, it had been built in multiple sections quickly. Um, it was built uh, based on the writings of Thomas Kirkbride. So those of you who are familiar with Fergus Falls uh, Mental Health Institution, it was built on the same guiding principles as this hospital was. So there's a lot of similarities in the way it was uh, master planned and designed. Uh, so it, Oregon, it had the unique distinction of it was still in operation as a mental health institution and it was going to continue to be a mental health institution. So we were, we were just upgrading it to continue. But that included they were going to build a whole bunch of new buildings on the same campus and we uh, as the preservation team on this actually kind of got relegated to doing the exterior repairs of the portion of this building that they retained and all of the interiors that you see in these three photos were basically destroyed um which is kind of sad in a way um you know this was an example of where and the interiors were sacrificed for the sake of being able to keep the building. Uh, when we first got on the project, there was actually discussion about taking this entire building down and just taking the cupola on top of it and putting that in the ground somewhere. Uh, so this is an example of compromise and where sometimes you, you do end up having to sacrifice an interior space. Um, not what we'd like to do, but um, preservation is all about compromise, right? <laughs> So these are a couple of other projects that I worked on uh, where we had buildings that were abandoned. Um, so on the left is the hospital at the Angel Island Immigration Station. So this is the Ellis Island of the West. This is where people that were immigrating from the East, mostly, uh, you know, from China and Japan, uh, were, were detained. And there were several buildings on the school campus. The, the island itself is pretty much uninhabited at this point and is, is mostly a tourist destination like its sister island Alcatraz. So um, our job in this case was actually to stabilize this building uh, and to try to keep it from deteriorating further and document it. Um, but obviously it's gonna be pretty hard to preserve some of these finishes just because of the the level of deterioration. On um, the right hand side here, this is actually a project I worked on when I was in graduate school at the University of Oregon. Uh, I did a condition assessment and I actually did the National Register nomination for this building. It's part of a few structures that remain from what was a large cement manufacturing facility there in Concrete, Washington, aptly named. The building itself, the structure was, of course, made of concrete. Uh, but, of course, these interior finishes are pretty much non-existent in some cases. The ceiling is on the floor. There's moss growing over it. And, you know, all of the wood is completely falling down and deteriorated. So this is one of those things where it was just neglected and not taken care of well enough. And we documented it pretty carefully. 
uh, we might be able to recreate some of this interiors, but we're really not going to be able to save much of what was originally there. So uh, sad, but all too often common, right? So the other challenge, of course, with dealing with historic interiors is, is finding new uses. Um, we always want to try to keep it as close to possible as the, the same uh, or a similar use. And then uh, if we have to make changes, we try to do it in the less historically significant spaces. And then, you know, new construction, we always like we do the program of what needs to be in the space and then we design the space around that. And preservation, we actually often go backwards. So we'll take the space and we're like, what can this be used for and how will this work for whatever we need? So. On the right here, this is a project I worked on uh, for Yosemite National Park. It's actually just outside the park, but still on Park Service land. Um, this is what was originally a, a hotel administration building. There are a series of duplex hotel rooms um, that are located behind this. The, the building had been through multiple uses. It had been um, the administrative and lobby for the hotel. It, most recently had been offices for the park service when we were brought in we were asked to take it from offices to a grocery store and kind of community center so this room with the fireplace in it the fireplace was basically the only historic uh detailing we were able to keep in the building uh, but we were actually able to restore this space which was originally the lobby into a cohesive space again it had been chopped up into offices so um you know partial gain partial loss but um just reason this is another project i was actually limitedly involved in i i came on the project like right as we were sending it out for bid so um debbie cooper there at, at arg was really the lead on this project but uh this is become known as in at the presidio but it was originally Pershing hall it was originally officer housing at the presidio and it it was small apartments. It made perfect sense to easily convert this with very little changes into hotel suites. This is just a really good example of how kind of the new use really kind of fit the building. So here's another example. This is the Greater Bethesda Missionary Baptist Church in, in South Chicago. Now, there's a lot of churches like this. It was actually originally built as a synagogue. This is in Hyde Park. This was a traditionally uh, a Jewish community. There was a lot of synagogues here. Um, but the demographics of the neighborhood changed. The most of the Jewish community kind of moved north in the city, and this neighborhood became prominent, predominantly African American um, and primarily Protestant. <laughs> So a lot of these uh, old synagogues were turned into churches. I've had the privilege to work on condition assessments in several of them, um, this just being one of them. So this took very minor changes to actually convert it from a synagogue to a church, right? It's just an assembly space. Uh, so what they did was they, they converted, like some of the stained glass windows had, you know, sayings that were in Hebrew. Uh, and they those were replaced. There was some uh, Hebrew symbols, Torahs, uh, Stars of David, things like that, some of which remain and some of which were removed. So um, it was a relatively easy conversion. Um, similarly, there's you know there's other examples of, of uh, worship spaces kind of changing the type of worship space. This church in particular, and this, this is true of a lot of the churches in this neighborhood, um, the great, greatest threat to this right now is just uh, the financial situation of the neighborhood. Um, this building uh, has lost a lot of its character. You'll notice on the balcony here, there's some stenciled panels there. Uh, there used to be stenciled panels elsewhere on the wall behind it and, and um, over the years, when those have been in bad condition, they've just been painted over the solid color paint because the congregation really just can't afford to have somebody come back and restore them. Um, and so it's little by little losing some of the character of the building. And um, obviously, you can see that there's also just some some major 
damage to the structure as well. There's been some water leaks from the roof and um, there's some plaster damage in the sanctuary as well. So uh, it's a real challenge with some of these churches. There was a, another church that I worked on a condition assessment um, that we, a group of us uh, did through Landmarks Illinois here and uh, another you know, African American Baptist Church, and we got through it, and we realized it was a structurally unstable building. It was a really, really bad discussion, tough discussion, with the pastor of the church that the evangelistic series he was planning to do the next week probably shouldn't happen in, in that space. So that's always, always a challenge. So back to this is that playground uh, clubhouse that I, I talked about earlier. So this is kind of a, a good example of how we were able to integrate some new systems into the building and stuff. So as I mentioned, this building got completely moved off of its foundations and moved back with the exception of the fireplace and chimney that stayed where it was. So they actually detached the building around the fireplace, moved it, put a new foundation under it, and then moved it back. And then we had to put new wiring. We had to do some reinforcing of the walls for lateral loads for seismic. And so every single piece of wood, vertical piece of wood you see on these walls was taken off, cataloged, stacked, and then once they'd done the repairs, it was installed back in its original order. So um, th this obviously was a, a character defining feature of the space. So it was important that we do that. Um, interesting side note this this project i was the advising architect um as i had mentioned before and the, the city of san francisco's bureau of architecture was the lead architect on it uh, and everybody on the project besides me spoke chinese the construct contractor was chinese so when they actually cataloged all these pieces it the the catalog marking was in chinese <laughs> Uh, it doesn't really matter which language it's done in, as long as it's properly cataloged and the people doing it know how to put it back together. So, yeah. So, um, we, there's a bunch of other, you know, things that we're adding to buildings. I just want to do it right. Obviously, mechanical, heating, electrical systems that have been outdated. Um, fire sprinklers, we'll look at those a little bit more. Um, adding data. Um, and we just talked about the finishes, so merchandise. So here's another uh, example of a kind of a difficult integration project that I worked on. This is Mission San Luis Rey. Um, it's one of the original California missions. It's Adobe. Uh, it was restored in 1790. Uh, <laughs> so much of the uh, building is actually dates from that time period, not from the original construction. Only the lower portion of the wall really kind of dates from before then. So there was a seismic project going on on this this project, and they they were doing fairly good with their fundraising, and they decided that they wanted to integrate new lighting and sound system into the space. Um, and this is just kind of a a really good example of kind of a trying to accommodate the current use. So this is. Clearly, a tourist destination. It's got that kind of interpretive museum like qualities to it. And, and certainly, there's actually a museum shop you know, in the complex here. Uh, but it is very much an active parish and an active monastery. So, there are actually uh, priests that live or monks that live here on this site. Some of them are cloistered, won't come out and we'll talk to you or talk to anybody. Um, in the kind of traditional way that you think of a monastery, um, but it also has a very active uh, and, and um, very involved uh, parish community. There's actually a separate parish church that was built that has a larger sanctuary than the mission church uh, where they have Sunday mass. But during the week on every morning, they still have mass in the historic sanctuary of the mission. So it was really important to them to still be able to use this as an active worship space. Many of their parishioners, especially the ones that attend morning masses, were elderly and have hearing and, and some vision problems. So it was really important to them to update the lighting and the sound system in this building. However, we have historic 
hand, hand pressed clay tile floor. We have adobe walls, which you know is is dirt with a little bit of plaster over it. Uh, not something you want to be running a, a bunch of trenches of wiring through and stuff. Um, and plus, it's got murals painted on it too, right? So that left us with only kind of one option, and that was to go into the ceiling. As you see, the the Vegas and the roof are, actually have stencil patterns on them. And so really the only thing that kind of wasn't a decorative finish in the space was the wood boards on the ceiling itself. So still historic finish, still a historic thing. There were some existing openings that had been cut here and that there were some lights that had, you can see kind of behind, uh, there were some lights that were installed through here. So that was really the only way we could install and attach stuff was to within the attic space here was to to cut some additional holes into this roof or, sorry roof ceiling um, and and attach things that way this was not without controversy i have to admit uh, so in addition to being a national historic landmark this building also has a preservation easement on it which is held by the california missions foundation so um, they weren't really thrilled with this approach but the the parish really just wanted they just needed this and the the missions were really more just looking at it as a his, historic interpretive site so there was a little bit of conflict between like kind of who, who's in charge of it and what's the most important thing for the site so so back to the awani so this is the great lounge in the awani so it's it's the main lobby space this photograph is one of Ansel Adams' photographs that was taken in 1943 of the space showing the original furniture and the layout. Um, and it's showing uh, most notably in the ceiling, we have some decorative medallions which, uh, on the beams. Uh, when I first started doing the research on this, when I was working on my thesis, there was already a fire uh, safety upgrade project planned for the the building. So there was a couple of components to that, one of which was installing new sprinklers in the building. Um, the firm that I ended up going to work for was actually doing this work. And I was, so I started out reviewing their work and then later ended up going to work for them. But, um, and these, these had been painted over. And so they didn't kind of, and without doing the historical research, they didn't really know that they were there. So my research was able to uncover that these were there we were able to adjust the, where those sprinkler heads were gonna be located in this building and and uh, do that. But I, I should back up and say that there's, there's one thing that happens in this space that really triggered this need for fire improvement in this room in particular. Uh, this is a year round hotel, but it does get snowy up here in Yosemite and people don't necessarily <laughs> especially Californians don't necessarily want to travel up into the mountains during the winter. So uh, one of the events that they they plan yearly and have since very early on in the hotel is what they call chef's holiday. And what they do is they have basically a chef's conference where they actually bring in a stage into this room. They bring in a gas fired stove and uh oven in here and they cook in this room <laughs> and 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 set it up as a, a conference room so uh, having open flame and a, a highly important um historic space was a huge concern and so that that actually was one of the triggers for doing this life safety upgrades and the fire suppression stuff so so um, just to show you how like the space um, changes function when you don't realize it necessarily. So, how are we doing on time here? Okay, so I'm going to start going a little quicker because it looks like we're going through. <laughs> so this is another uh, another hotel. This one, the interior surfaces were flammable, and we had to work through dealing with that and the fire life safety uh, for this building. I I worked on doing a code analysis of the exiting and, and some of the surfaces on this building. So, so all of the, the hotel surfaces in the in the rooms, in the corridors, and in the public spaces was a very flammable uh, material. 
So, and a historic material. So that was a challenge. Um, here's another project where um, this was a seismic upgrade project where we had to salvage some of the plaster work and some of the uh, wood paneling, uh, temporarily move it, catalog it, and then after the seismic reinforcement was installed, we had to reinstall it over that. And it didn't always go to back together exactly the way it had originally, so it was kind of a challenge to, to get the finishes to fit back in here. Um, so unattached items, um, this is the Lincoln home. Uh, we did a uh, kind of an ADA review of this building uh, right before the pandemic. <laughs> um, so let's let's kind of jump to the, the furniture and furnishings. Um, it's really important that you kind of deal with these in a little bit different way, right? Because there are, you need to document them. You need to have inventory of them and keep as much information as you can. So um, back to you know, that spreadsheet that I had of the historic furnishings report. Um, and then the other piece of this is you really need to get valuation of these uh, for your insurance purposes. And you wanna make sure that you have qualified conservators working on this work. But there's a lot of people out there that will refurnish furniture for you, whether it's wood furniture or upholstered furniture, um, but, as you would expect in preservation, we don't necessarily want to refinish. Sometimes we just want to touch up a finish. And understanding that conservation approach is really important. So you want to make sure that you hire somebody that's, that understands that approach to things. Um, the other thing that we have to do is kind of adapt uh, designs to new use and kind of new functions. So on the picture on the left is one of the 1943 photographs of the Iwani, one of the guest rooms. And, it was pretty up to date in its day when it was built in 1927, but pretty outdated for what our current standards are for a hotel room. On the right is, is what the hotel rooms looked like in around 1910 when we, or not 2010, when we were doing this, this report. Every single room had exactly the same uh, window coverings and um, bedspreads, even though each room had, had a distinctive color scheme that went with the stenciled border that was in the room. So um, I was thinking about how you keep that feel of this and do with that. So, so we're almost in the end here. So housekeeping is always a key thing. Again, this is in the Iwani Hotel. This is the mural room. This fireplace hood uh, was a originally patinaed, uh, and it was always intended to be patinaed. And a very well-meaning staff person overcleaned it. So this is the well-meaning overcleaning, right? So it is now this highly polished surface. It was never intended to be that way. Um, so that that's always kind of one of the problems. The other problem we run into is kind of the lack of, house, uh, lack of cleaning and housekeeping, right? So. I, that all comes down to just the, the necessity to like actually prepare a building specific cleaning and housekeeping plan. And you're going to want to work with your designers and your uh, conservators in particular to come up with what products are appropriate, what processes are appropriate for cleaning all of the different pieces that you have building. So here's a, a few couple uh, resources for kind of housekeeping and conservation work in general related to furniture and furnishings. I, I can also send this to you guys later. So, And then also um, just some more resources in general about interiors and interior finishes. Um, just a list of few of the relevant preservation briefs and tech notes uh, related to that. Obviously, there's a ton more information. There's books and articles, lots of other stuff. Um, I didn't note it here, but one another source is the Association for Preservation Technology. Um, their bulletin often has articles related to historic finishes as well. So it's also another really great resource. So that's all I have. I think we have a couple minutes for questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Heidi. Excellent presentation. You covered you covered a lot of ground. I learned yeah. I learned a lot. So working in environmental review, section 106 review, we don't usually delve into interiors as much as my colleagues right. that work on historic tax credit reviews. 
or grant reviews um, when uh, some of my colleagues also do that. But um, boy, what a range of work you've done from the Awani Hotel to religious organizations and museum quality to I'm guessing tax credit rehabs with with many of those other projects. So yeah, um, so we got yeah quite, quite a range. And I see we still have some attendees. Good. Sometimes I didn't. People are a little shy. What I can also do is if um, Jason says fantastic presentation. Thank you. And that's coming from an archaeologist, so that's good. Um, well, archaeology is with the other range. I've, I've worked on projects where I've worked with archaeologists too. That's a lot of fun. So. Yeah. Um, here's a question. Do you ever advocate the use of original materials and original mechanical slash electrical technologies, even though advanced systems and materials exist? So this is a tough one, especially on the electrical side, um, because a lot of times the old uh, wiring has cloth and it's not it, it's a fire hazard, quite frankly. Um, what we would try to do in those situations often is just to kind of keep the visible portions of it. So like if we had a push button electrical switch or something, uh, you can get new kind of replica push button switches, or you can even sometimes rewire an old one. Um, but the, the actual wires in the wall should be updated <laughs> and if possible, put in conduit. Um, mechanical systems likewise right like we'd have a a radiator and we're gonna like redo that radiator and maybe we're gonna get a third it maybe it was originally steam and we're gonna convert it to hot water which because it's more efficient um so and we might replace the boiler but the the visible component like that that actually radiator we're gonna keep uh, similarly like with the mechanical grills um for like a, a forced air system or something we'll keep the grills but maybe the the duct work and certainly the furnace that's behind it um, will update. So that's usually it's usually the visible pieces that we try to keep um, there. I have come across some buildings where, you know, there was some really kind of unique um, systems that you kind of almost wanted to keep them. Uh, I didn't talk about it in this presentation because it's not so much an interiors project, but when I was working in San Francisco, I worked on Fort Point, which is a civil air Civil War era fort, and we actually did a full investigation of the uh, rainwater catchment system in the fort and the cisterns and uh, trying to figure out if we could possibly reuse those. We came to the grudging conclusion that we could not, <laughs> but um, there was a lot of desire on, on the part of the whole team from the, um, you know, the local park to the regional office to the folks at the Denver Service Center really wanted to restore that system, but we we really just there was a bunch of technical issues with it. We couldn't do it. Yeah, your inspectors are just like, oh my gosh, no, we're not gonna. Deal we were with just this. concerned overall with condition of the system that we might be introducing water leaks into the system that would potentially damage the building in other ways. So yeah, I know one unique. Um, project and I'm sure you in, in living in Minnesota, you probably toured the James J. Hill house. Maybe, maybe not. You but... know, I didn't. I, I've been to Glen Sheen, though. I've been to oh. that one. <laughs> one thing they do take when they take you down to the basement of the Hill House, and I assume they still do this. I haven't taken a tour there in a while. Is they go down to the boiler room, and what they did in the with the 1980s restoration was fairly unique. Is that they preserved the look of these two giant coal-fed boiler with the big boiler doors. Mm -hmm. this uh, masonry wall that they're built into but behind there it's it's a fake facade because behind there is the new modern boiler but from from the museum tour side uh it looks it looks right. historic so that was a way this to same, keep, same concept, keep the look of it but behind the scenes the actual yeah. system is something updated um, and it's interesting because they also do show take people in closets and um that was you know it was just sort of hot air that went through all different kinds of shoots and ducts throughout the house you know they didn't really care about coal and and, <laughs> and actually they used hot air to to melt the snow on top of the roof as well so there were air ducts that went all the way up to the roof eaves um yeah. so they you know they'll peek you peek in closets and things like that and in a house like that you can kind of show those old systems um, because they've sort of been preserved in place. Yeah. So uh, the Alameda Theater that 
I didn't get to work on, but I was familiar with because my firm worked on it. Um, it was one of those theaters too that had an early air conditioning system where they had the ice blocks that they'd bring into the basement and, and melt oh, yeah. and stuff. So there was some cool stuff there that you know the public doesn't really see. Um, one of the historic houses that actually I showed a couple of photographs of um, is the Polo House in, in um, not, sorry, Baker House in Polo, Illinois, and it had an early air conditioning system in it as well. It was fascinating. Um, the house was pretty much unoccupied. The, the homeowners that had just bought it, when I talked to them, they, um, it, but basically it was a second home. They lived in Chicago and they, this was their kind of resort home. <laughs> so, um, they were, it was a, a, uh, labor of love. <laughs> they were just starting when I talked to them. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah. Tom, our, one of our participants adds in, the original organ blower for the library pipe organ, this is in the Hill House, was there in the basement of the Hill House. It ran on water pressure to produce the organ wind. So yeah, these That's like historic cool. systems, um, if some of those features can be preserved. That's always an excellent way to show people how these Some uh, of the historic operate. churches that I've worked on too, they have um, you know, getting into the, his, the uh, organ chambers and looking at the mm -hmm. organs. Um, that's really a cool part of, of the features of that building. And, you know, those are built in features, right? The organs yep. are built in. Mm -hmm. And, um, so it's 1 of those interesting things where it kind of is a furnishing. It's an instrument, but it's yeah. also attached to the building. So, um, that was always a question of like, well, is this, would this be a qualifying uh, expenditure to redo an organ or not? And, um. But my my mom is actually uh, has her master's in organ, so I'm particularly interested with historical organs. So. Yeah, the Hill House has an ha a house organ, but you know, at forty thousand square feet, it can. But I've seen smaller houses that have organs built into them, and that's that's pretty that's pretty neat. That's something to think about. So we have about two minutes left. Now is your chance, participants, to get your last questions in. If you have a burning question, I don't see any questions. You must have covered everything. No, it's just like I've overwhelmed everybody. <laughs> Lots to think about, but some great, great examples of um, all different types of buildings that people run into from little depots with simple interiors to much more complicated mm -hmm. state hospitals and mission right. buildings. It's not just about a historic house museum. And Awani Hotel, which I was, I looked up to see how much it costs to stay a night there and it's expensive but it looks nice if i go to yosemite that's where i, I have to there. say that the entire time i worked on that building i only stayed there one night and it was because i was comped there from the adjacent uh yosemite lodge not because oh. i booked it there i couldn't afford it yeah starting at 340 dollars a night, night yeah. at a different hotel <laughs> <laughs> that's a special occasion yeah well i don't see any questions and um we're at the time of our thank you again so much heidi for um participating in our state conference and presenting this important uh information to our participants here again from the participants. Flash up. was there one last question um let's see was there a chat oh yes yeah, somebody put a question in the chat sorry do you encounter a lot of materials where there are no longer any craftsmen trained to repair the historic material, really big question. Occasionally. So there's a couple of great resources for that. Um, the Preservation Trade Network is a great mm -hmm. resource. Obviously, uh, the Minnesota Historical Society keeps a list of people that are trained to do preservation as well. Um, and there are like some specialty firms, especially for interior finishes. So like Conrad Schmidt out of Wisconsin, uh, Evergreen, uh, here out of Oak Park, um, and they do work all, both of those firms do work all over the country. There's a, a plasterer here in town that I'm familiar with, um, who does work all over the country as well. He works a lot with Evergreen and Conrad Schmidt actually in, in tandem with him. He'll do the plaster work and they'll do the, uh, the finishes on top of them. Uh, there are times, uh, I know when I was working on the Minnesota State Capitol many years ago, like we looked at like some of the marble that was in the bathrooms and stuff like that just is no longer available and the quarries quarried out, right? Um, so sometimes you do have to find substitute materials, um, just like you do on exterior 
projects as well. Sometimes you do have to find substitute materials. So um, that that's part of the challenge. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. There aren't as many who know those crafts and those and how to work with those materials. We need to yeah. get people back into the into that work. So, well, thank you again, Heidi. I don't think we have, we don't have any more questions. Okay. And again, this will be for the participants. This will be up um, on our YouTube. You'll get a link for the for where the recording is if you want to watch it again. Because there's a lot of information in this presentation. Thank you. you might want to freeze it and look at the screens or something. That's right. Stop there and write it down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if anybody wants a copy of the presentation, I'm happy to share that. Oh, as well. good. Good to know. I will let I'll let Mike Coop know that as well. Thank you.